public sector union says they want their members who are put on unpaid leave to be reimbursed for the time they were on unpaid leave. Will the government reimburse civil servants who were unvaccinated and placed on unpaid leave? I know uh, Minister Fortier is working with union uh, members, so she's uh, dealing with this issue, and I don't have a comment. Ma on that. But the, the, the can you just clarify? You? Can be scrapped for Americans trying to come across on the land border? Uh, are you at all considering scrapping the Arrive Can app or the vaccine mandate for uh, the land border with the U.S.? So, uh, first of all, um, Arrive Can is an important tool that continues to be valuable to protecting the health and safety of Canadians and those who are arriving. Uh, having said that, I know Minister Medicino is working with our caucus colleagues, with our mayors, with stakeholders on figuring out what else can we do to improve the process. Pearson and the airlines say this whole mess is your fault. How much really lies with the airlines and how much with Service Canada and CATSA? But Look, uh, I don't know if Canadians will have any patience for hearing me or others point fingers. All I am saying is that our government is committed to uh, focusing on addressing these matters. We have been increasing resources at an incredible pace. We have been working with airlines and airports to address bottlenecks. And we are seeing data sh demonstrate that those uh, uh, that those efforts are paying dividend over the last few weeks, but we still need to continue to do our work with airlines and with airports. So you've done all your work. What does the GTAA and the airlines need to do now to what do you see their, their move to do now to help things? Well, look, we will continue to support them. Airports and airlines need to continue to add resources, need to continue to streamline processes, need to continue to focus on being agile and moving resources as we see schedules adjust. So we will work with them on, on, on responding to uh, the evolving situation. And accountability? Does, is, there, is there accountability towards the airports, towards CATSA, towards yourself, or it should should we just walk away from this and just get it fixed? Uh, look, airports are accountable to their board of directors, um, and airlines are accountable to shareholders. However, I, Transport Canada is the regulator for airlines, and, and we are certainly working with airports. So we are going to make sure to ensure that travel is safe, travel is efficient, and that travelers' experience is as best as, they, as, as we can make it. As a Mississauga MP, are you still flying back and forth to Mississauga? Are you driving? Like, what's, uh, what's I'm your mostly flying. Occasionally I drive, but I, I flew this week. And how was it? To Pearson or Hamilton? Uh, this week was from uh, Billy Bishop, but uh, the previous week was from Pearson. How long did you wait? Uh, actually, I have uh, not had uh, a bad experience at all. I have been through CATSA very quickly. I don't have an international arrival because yeah. I go through CATSA. It has not been uh, a long period at all, or any waiting for that matter. Ms. Having said that, I'm not dismissing the fact that there are people still waiting and we need to do everything we can to address those. Minister, did the airlines ramp up their flights too fast before all the airports and everybody had had room and time to staff up. Is that part of the problem that we have too many flights going? Oh, I think it's it's it, we're seeing a surge in passengers in travelers' demand uh, for travel after two year uh, two difficult years of no travel at all. So we're seeing surge in demand, and we're seeing airlines and airports trying to keep up with the demand. But did they Thank put you too many much. flights? The federal government's vaccine mandates for civil servants. Has the government done the legal analysis that it knows that it will stand up in court if the unions challenge the fact that people were on unpaid leave because they were unvaccinated? Are you on solid legal ground? Look, I give my advice. I give my advice to cabinet, so I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give it to you. But suffice it to say that we we look at all uh, aspects of the question when we when we analyze it. So you think that you won't have to pay people? I'm not giving you a legal advice. I'm not giving you a legal opinion. Uh, I give my legal opinions to cabinet. But is it? Je donne mes opinions juridiques au cabinet, uniquement, au premier ministre, uniquement. Mais, mais comme je viens de dire en anglais, on fait des analyses euh, et, et on, on, on... But you usually, you usually tell us if you're on child legal footing or not. You usually at least tell us, yes, we've done the legal analysis and we believe we did the right thing or we follow the laws. You won't even go that far. Does that no, mean that you didn't no, follow not, the laws? No, I'm not saying that at all. We're all I'm, I always believe that when we promulgate a law that we're on, on solid legal footing. That's part of my job. But the mandates weren't a law. They were a rule that your government put in. So I'm any, wondering if, if they will stand up in court any, when the unions require or ask the government we're, to we're repay civil servants. Uh, whether it's a law, whether it's a regulation that we promulgate or, or a rule that we promulgate, we're, we're confident that we're on solid legal footing. That's the analysis that I do. But I'm not going to give you a particular answer. 
uh, because I give those to Cal. Thank, thank, thank you. you. dollars on a pri uh, government plane during a week-long trip in the Middle East. Do you think that number is appropriate? We don't have the context yet around what that money was spent on, but nearly $100,000. First I'm hearing about it, so I'd have to look at it more. I don't, I'm not aware of it at all. Mr. Holland, can you give us an update on what happened in your House Leaders conversation yesterday about what's happening for the hybrid and vaccines for the House? I'm sure we had a productive conversation yesterday. Uh, uh, this morning, uh, all the parties are meeting with their respective caucuses. Uh, after those discussions, uh, it's, uh, we're going to be having further conversations, and it's my hope by, uh, uh, certainly uh, in the next couple of days that we'll be able to finalize uh, what we're going to be doing with the precinct. Mr. Allen, C'est tellement important pour nous uh, de continuer la croissance économique et uh, on a un bon plan pour ça. Et uh, je pense que le, le ministre des Finances a proposé une bonne solution de régler l'inflation, mais s'assurer que uh, la prospérité pour le pays uh, va continuer. Uh, nous sommes dans une excellente position en contraste de, de l'autre pays uh, partout au monde et on va continuer avec notre plan. C'est pour moi, c'est probablement une bonne question pour le ministre des Finances, généralement. J'ai offert un petit commentaire, mais... Uh, je pense que la situation mondiale est difficile, mais le Canada a continué uh, d'agir comme une, uh, une leader uh, au monde uh, dans le, dans le, le, uh, le, le taille de, 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 de conscience économique et dans les autres aspects. Alors, uh, j'ai beaucoup d'optimisme pour notre économie. Uh, je pense qu'on a besoin de tout le temps qui est disponible pour uh, le Parlement. Uh, on a beaucoup de législation. Uh, la législation uh, uh, pour, les, uh, 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 pour C5, C11, uh, C21. Uh, et uh, alors, uh, uh, on, uh, on va, on, on va je pense qu'on a besoin de tout le temps qui est disponible. Alors, je pense qu'on va uh, continuer ici jusqu'à Saint-Jean-Baptiste. Est-ce que vous n'allez pas devoir faire des choix à un moment donné à, au lieu de dire que c'est les conservateurs qui font de l'obstruction? Est-ce que vous êtes prêts à faire des choix? Puis lequel de ces projets de loi-là vous allez prioriser? C'est pour moi, tous les, les, les projets de loi, euh, 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 on doit adopter chaque projet de loi qui est là maintenant. Et euh, oui, il euh, y, a, y a beaucoup d'obstructions de, de, qui viennent de, de Parti euh, conservateur. Mais euh, euh, ça, c'est tellement, euh, euh, ça, ça c'est vraiment malheureux. Mais euh, en même temps, euh, on a beaucoup d'appui euh, qui vient de l'MPD et le Bloc québécois. Et je pense qu'on euh, peut euh, travailler ensemble, de trouver une solution, d'adopter euh, plusieurs projets de loi euh, dans les prochaines euh, semaines. Sur la séance, est-ce que c'est vrai que vous ne voulez pas presser le pas au sénateur, que vous voulez leur laisser le temps, et s'il faut jusqu'à l'automne pour qu'ils étudient? Oui, I mean, j'ai eu beaucoup de conversations avec le Sénat et uh, j'ai expliqué, expliqué clairement que c'est une priorité pour nous d'adopter uh, uh, au Sénat les, les projets de loi aussi rapide que possible. Uh, mais maintenant, uh, mon priorité est d'adopter le projet de loi aux chambres de communes. Et uh, après ça, on va continuer notre travail avec le Sénat. Merci beaucoup. Can you just talk about the amendments that they were discussed in discussion about for the well, I think that it, was, uh, it was an important discussion, and at the end of the day, the important thing is that uh, uh, the bill is moving on, because that's what Keynes and, and the cultural sector is asking for. Some, some, some. Ben, so. ben, je ne connais pas le contexte, il faut qu'elle réponde. Je ne sais pas c'est quoi le contexte, je ne sais pas combien de monde ou quoi que ce soit. Il faut qu'elle réponde, c'est sûr. Sur séance, le Sénat, vous avez dit, vous ne voulez pas leur le pas au sénateur. Est-ce que ce serait correct d'attendre jusqu'à l'automne? Soit... Moi, je voudrais que ce soit le plus vite possible. J'ai des rencontres avec les sénateurs, tant de façon individuelle qu'en groupe. Je pense qu'ils comprennent tous l'importance de bouger rapidement. Il y a, une, il y a une, des conséquences réelles pour le secteur de la culture. Il y a des opportunités qui se perdent. Um, alors, j'espère qu'on va bouger le plus rapidement possible. La présence d'Oliver Stone au festival, <rire> Fédéral est un commanditaire. Ouais. Mr. Miller. 
Is the Pope said trip to Canada still a given, um, considering that he, you know, has delayed his trip to Africa? Well, obviously, the state of health of the of the Holy Father is a concern. Um, where, where all systems go in Canada in terms of hosting um, effectively what is a head of state. But obviously, uh, his precarious health is, a, is of extreme concern, obviously, um, to, to everyone. Um, so it's, um, it's something that we'll have to plan for and, 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 uh, and continue to engage with, um, with the CCCB, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. Um, but um, as far as I know, we're, it's all systems go. No change at the moment to the schedule or plans for him to travel and all to all? There's no change. Uh, obviously, a state of health would perhaps require some accommodation, but those are details that we'll be uh, working on internally with, um, with all the parties involved. And will Canadian, uh, Canadian government yeah, yeah. pay for survivors to travel to meet the Pope if he does visit Canada? Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of work that we need to do to make sure that survivors can properly uh, have that moment with, with the Pope. Uh, and that's, that, that's the support that the government will always provide. Uh, obviously, when you talk about spaces, there's a lot of logistics and planning as to who gets invited, um, whether it's in Edmonton, in, in Quebec City, or in Iqaluit, as well as flights and coordination, particularly with um, an advanced age group of people, so that, and, and the emotional, psychological supports that need to be, need to be uh, provided for. So that's something where we'll always step in to help with, um, with the organization. So a yes to paying for the trouble or just organizing? Yeah, it's work, that we're, work, work that we're doing internally. Thank you so much. Minister Fraser, do you think they're calling Mr. Minister Mendicino should quit? The Conservatives are asking for, they think that he can no longer fight his job. Look, Marco is a, uh, a tremendously talented minister and I think he's done an excellent job in public safety. I, I trust him completely in his responsibilities and, uh, and I, I've said as much to him as well. And uh, I think this is all for show. Uh, sorry guys, I'm, I'm running behind schedule here. Sorry, I, I haven't seen her uh, her testimony, I'm afraid. But uh, look, I'm just behind for caucus, but uh, happy to chat maybe on the way out. We're seeing the uh, Agricultural Committee starting to, starting to study food security um, with the focus on the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, just, uh, tell us a bit of background on why this is uh, such a committee priority right now. Yeah, well, look, I think it's one of the most important questions that uh, we all collectively in the world are facing. Uh, we've heard from uh, Minister Solsky, who is the Minister of Agriculture in Ukraine. We've heard from members of Parliament about how the Russian Federation is explicitly targeting agriculture infrastructure. Ukraine is an important global exporter to the market, and because a lot of their actual product right now is not able to get to market, uh, it has consequences on particularly vulnerable countries, uh, but we're going to see food inflation across the world, uh, including here in Canada, but also countries that uh, are in really uh, desperate situations. So we thought it was pertinent to study what Canada can do to respond, understand the context internationally, look at what other countries are doing, and then bring it back home on how best uh, we can provide recommendations to the government. And of course, uh, the Prime Minister is going to be heading to the Commonwealth Summit next week and the G7 and NATO. At these uh, you know, high-level world leader talks, uh, should global food security be a bigger priority on the agenda than they are seeing right now? Well, I think it is, uh, and I think it's going to be. As you mentioned, the Prime Minister is going to Africa, and he's going to as part of the G7 and NATO uh, conferences, and I suspect uh, that it will be a top agenda issue. Uh, it obviously, the issue of global food security has a humanitarian element to it. It has a geopolitical element in terms of actually what uh, perhaps Minister Jolie, along with her counterparts, can be able to work out solutions to be able to get a trade corridor, to be able to move the 22 million uh, estimated 22 million tons of grain that are actually in Ukraine that can get to the global market. So there's a lot of different dynamic. It's complex, uh, but the uh, look, I, it's on the top of the agenda of this government and indeed many governments around the world. And of course, uh, Canada, one of the world's bread baskets, uh, just like Ukraine. Uh, does the committee see there being a way for Canadian producers to step up and try to fill some of these gaps or with our own um, export contracts, our own supply lines? be too strained if you try to fill the gaps left by Ukraine. There's a couple things that you're seeing. Uh, you saw Nutrien, which is the world's largest uh, fertilizer producer right here in Canada, is announcing a 25% increase in terms of their volumes uh, that they're going to be producing. That's by 2025. Uh, at the same time, oh, we had an issue here? Okay. Sorry, I saw you flagging. I'll, I'm happy to do it again. Okay. No, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, we're just getting maybe a two-star that one just done. Where can Canada step up to try to fill this hole that might be great? 
there's, there's a couple different elements. One is, of course, uh, international aid and some of the support that we can give to humanitarian groups, the World Food Program. Uh, but bringing it back home, you see companies like Nutrien that are uh, making announcements to try to increase their production by about 25% by 2025. Uh, farmers, uh, particularly in Western Canada, where we have the, uh, the crops that are similar to Ukraine, which are being blocked, the market signals are already really high in terms of them planting and doing as much as they can. So it's going to really depend on the harvest that we can have this year. It's important to remember that we're coming in a bit of a, a difficult position last year, particularly on the prairie, uh, significant drought. So we're a bit on our back heels in terms of what we can do. But the point that I would highlight is this is not just a 2022 problem. The consequences of the war are going to have reverberating impacts far beyond 2022. So the work has to be what can we do in the short term uh, to respond? And then what can we do to make sure that the agriculture industry in Canada is, is going to be ready and poised uh, for perhaps more production in 2023, 2022? 24. These things don't move uh, quickly. Uh, it takes time to prepare, and that's what our committee will be providing longer term recommendations as well. I'm just, I'll give a little bit of uh, uh, work for you. So, look, I think the study is going to take three distinct areas. One is understanding the context, what Canada can do in the short term. The second part, of course, is what other countries are doing to aid their domestic producers. And the third part is going to be what we can do at home in terms of being able to position. Uh, there's things like supply chains, looking at making sure the railroads are prepared to be able to move the product to global markets. What we can do on ports to make sure there's efficiency to be able to get Canadian product to global market. Um, those are things that I think are going to be important on the domestic sense. We saw the Minister of Agriculture, um, my colleague Marc Lobibo, has provided additional extension on the advanced payment program, which provides additional liquidity for farmers uh, who are who are dealing with higher input costs right now as well. So we're looking forward to the study. We've heard really important testimony in terms of uh, the way in which Russia has explicitly targeted. We've heard from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations about measures including temporary silos to store grain uh, just in case we're not able to get the 22 million tons that are currently in storage right now. Ukraine's capacity is largely full, so what can we do in the interim to not only try to move the grain, but make sure that there's adequate space and storage for the uh, crops that will be coming off the fields in 2022? I just have one final question. It's uh, Dave Remind here to you. Um, just, I know we're a couple of years um, removed from uh, the grain backlogs where uh, we're having the rail car issues. Um, has maybe heard if it, all of that's been cleared up at this point, or are we still seeing uh, you know, some challenges uh, moving our grain? There's, uh, look, any time that there is a commodity increase in terms of prices right now, whether it's oil and gas, uh, whether or not it's potash and the, the inputs for fertilizer, and of course the market signals uh, on food, uh, it creates challenges in our rail capacity. Now, I, I know Minister Al Gabra, for example, has reached out to the leadership in both CN and CP to try to say, what can you do to prepare for what's coming down the line? I think that's going to be a critical aspect in terms of our transportation corridors uh, to be able to get that there. Um, and, and really, that's, I think, one of the areas the Government of Canada can focus on. Again, a lot of our industry is going to be doing their part. They see the market signals. Our farmers are going to be planting and doing everything they can. Uh, what can we do kind of with other partners to make sure there's easy access uh, to get our product to uh, world market? Good. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.